By the 19th and 20th centuries, European powers had built massive empires stretching to all corners of the spherical globe. While some places had already broken off from the empires by this point, most of the world's land had been at least claimed by a European power in some capacity, with a few massive exceptions. When you look at the countries that were never colonized by European powers, you quickly see places like Japan and Thailand and Ethiopia, as well as some more dubious inclusions like Liberia, which was colonized by the United States of not Europe. But look in this general area, and you see another pretty big exception that no one seems to talk about. Iran. So, why was Iran never colonized? Well, it kind of was, but not really. Let me explain. <laughs> Thanks to MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. Okay, so it's the end of the 19th century. Carriages are starting to lose their horses, most of the rest of the world still calls Iran Persia, and Britain and Russia are really close to bordering each other. No, like, over here. Now, Iran might not have specifically been part of any European empire, but that doesn't mean it went through the 19th and 20th centuries free from heavy European influence. After centuries fighting their Mediterranean neighbor to the west, like they've seemingly been doing for the past 2500 years, Iran found itself in conflict with Russia, who had been conquering lands in Central Asia and the Caucasus, and Britain to the east, who had just taken over India pretty much out of a thousand years of pent-up flavor deprivation. And Iran found itself in the good luck spot. Not because it was good luck, but because it's the sort of situation that makes people say, Oh, good luck, buddy. Southwest Asia had become the center of a power play between these two superpowers, one which would become known as the Great Game. Go fish. Britain and Russia had begun to take over territories from Iran's Qatar dynasty, including Herat, which was ceded to Afghanistan, also a notable British non-colony. The Qatars tried to strengthen the Iranian state through a series of measures and reforms that would later be known as defensive modernization. It actually kind of reminds me of what Japan was doing a few decades prior. However, this didn't exactly pan out. Iran's government at this time suffered from weak and largely divided institutions. Thus, while the government had a massive deficit, it didn't have the strength it needed to effectively raise taxes, with the government attempting other ways of making money. In 1872, for instance, Nasser Adin Shah sold off the rights to build new dams, trams, railroads, regular roads, mines, and industrial plants to Baron Julius to Reuter, for which the newspaper is named after, an arrangement Lord Curzon described as the most complete surrender of the entire resources of a kingdom into foreign hands that has ever been dreamed of, much less accomplished, in history. But then, Germany wanted to build a railroad from Berlin to Baghdad, which Britain and Russia feared would make the Ottoman Empire a German ally. The 1907 Anglo-Russian Convention saw Iran split into a British and a Russian exclusive influence zone, leaving a neutral buffer zone in the middle, all marked by the European classic, awkward straight lines that pay no attention to anything. In the name of ending hostilities between the two powers, this treaty saw Iran, Afghanistan, and Tibet become little more than Anglo-Russian buffer zones. Which actually, fun fact, is why Afghanistan has this weird little finger corridor up here. Then, in 1908, Attitudes toward Iran suddenly changed for no particular reason. Working under a concession from the Iranian government, British businessman William Darcy hired George Reynolds to prospect for oil. Nope. After seven years of searching across no. the country, oh, oil was it. finally discovered in Khuzestan, and the Anglo-Persian Oil Company was founded the following year. With the British government owning a majority stake in the company, this effectively meant that Britain now controlled Iran's oil exports. Now, something I think is really important to understand about Iran is that it is incredibly diverse. It's not just Persians, as Azeris, Turkmens, Baluchis, Arabs, Kurds, and dozens of other groups from across this general area all live within this 80 million strong country. And you know, you probably have a diverse ancestry as well. But can you name all your great-grandparents? What about your great-great-grandparents? If you want to understand your family and your heritage, why not check out My Heritage? Not my heritage specifically, that'll be Genie of Lager's job next year. No, my heritage is a leading service for family history and DNA testing around the world, with over 90 million customers provided with over 18 billion historical records to look through. With my heritage, discovering your old relatives and building your family tree couldn't be simpler. In fact, you can even bring your ancestors back to life. Well, not in the Frankenstein y kind of way. Since MyHeritage gives you the tools to repair, colorize, and even animate old pictures. See what they would have looked like in real life, you know? In fact, it's not only useful for finding out where your ancestors came from, or if you share ancestry with any famous historical figures, 
but you can also learn of distant relatives you never knew about. You can even get in touch with them, and they can even show you what they found about their, and also your, ancestors. Sign up for a 14-day free trial and enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. And if you decide you want to continue your subscription, click the link below and you'll also get a 50% discount. When World War the original series struck, Iran declared itself neutral. Although, given their position right between Britain, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, which the first two were now at war against, this declaration of neutrality didn't exactly amount to much. Yeah, we feel you there, bud. Russia, supported by Britain, the Ottomans, supported by Germany, and the Qajars, supported by no one in Europe, fought for virtually the entirety of the war, even after Russia had to punch out a year early. Something about communism? Not sure. The Persian campaign eventually ended with the Treaty of Mudros, alongside Turkey's surrender from the war entirely, which is a whole story for another time, and afterwards in the Anglo-Persian Agreement of 1919, which gave the Anglo-Persian oil company drilling rights all across Iran. With Russia abandoning its sphere of influence in the north, Britain wanted to establish a protectorate over Iran, much like it already had across the Middle East. However, many other powers, namely the United States, denounced this move as hegemonic, as the US did not like colonial empires, and also wanted to drill for Iranian oil. In addition, the agreement would be denounced by the Iranian Majlis, or Parliament, just three years afterward. I <laughs> like that actually changed anything. Between the wars, the Qajar dynasty would be replaced by the new Pahlavi dynasty, and the anglo persian Iranian oil company signed a 60-year agreement promising to pay Iran four pounds for every ton of oil exported, in exchange for Iran having no control over its oil exports. In World War the Next Generation, Iran noticed that German armies had been quite successful in their campaigns against the Soviet Union. Expecting Germany to ultimately win the war, clearly not realizing how terrifying that would have been, Iran refused Britain and the Soviet Union's request to expel German residents within Iran. And so the two invaded the country to ensure the Persian corridor would stay open, allowing supplies shipped into the Persian Gulf to still reach the Soviet Union. Reza Shah Pahlavi was deposed in place of his more Western-friendly crown prince, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, who would continue to rule until the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Now, Iran might not have been part of the British Empire like India or Egypt, but by the mid-20th century, it would have been hard to doubt Britain's influence over Iran. When Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh tried to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company in 1953, he was met with a coup that ousted him from power and thrust the Shah back into the number one spot. But if you want to see how this all pans out in the latter half of the 20th century, well, this video was actually a collaboration with the channel Faultline. This is Iran in the 1950s. If you look at the way that people are dressed, what kind of cars they're driving, and everything else, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was somewhere like San Francisco. Then in the 80s, Iran began to look more like this. Now, as any video on this channel will tell you, you can't truly understand a country and its motivations without understanding its geography. To find out more about this, head over to my channel, Faultline, after this video. You know what? Actually, I'm bad at writing conclusions, so this video is over.